I'm Gabriela Fresquez, and this is Radar 2020. 2020 has exposed America in so many ways. We're going in the wrong direction. Back to go! Our position as one of the wealthiest nations in the world wasn't enough to shield us from a pandemic that's claimed nearly 200,000 lives in the U.S. alone. A pandemic that's affected black and brown communities at disproportionate rates and one that, unfortunately, isn't the only threat that black and brown people in this country have to worry about. The documented death of George Floyd at the hands of police lit the match that fueled mass protests all around the world. It fanned the flames of anger and distrust over the unresolved killings of others like Breonna Taylor, Daniel Prude, Elijah McClain. The list goes on and on. They have me! Breonna Taylor! The lockdown exposed our nation's vulnerabilities, and the collapse of our so-called safety nets paired with the injustice perpetrated by those sworn to protect us has created the perfect kindling for the brush fire that's slowly been burning for about um, several hundred years. Systemic racism in America and the impunity with which law enforcement kills unarmed black people. Protesters have been calling for accountability from the officers responsible, which for me seems like something we shouldn't have to ask for at all. And now, a call to defund police is dominating the conversation. And look, I know, I know the mere mention is enough to send the pearl-clutching abuelas in the room straight to cable news. Pero fíjate, defund police isn't it about total anarchy. It's a call to divest funds away from police forces so they can be reallocated back into black communities in the form of things like mental health services, education, and affordable housing. The kinds of investments that are significant for building peaceful, flourishing communities, whereas over-policing is seen as a threat to these same communities. When we talk about Black Lives Matter as a movement, the conversation isn't solely about police brutality. It's about combating systemic racism in general. Sometimes we say the system is broken, and it is broken, and people say, oh no, it was designed to be like that. And our takeaway is that it was designed, that people made it up because people made it up, we can make something better. So when we hear the system is broken, we are always mindful that it doesn't have to be. And when your country's justice system is rooted in white supremacy, we can safely assume it's got kinks, and not the fun kind. I got a chance to talk with DeRay McKesson, co-founder of Campaign Zero and one of the earliest supporters of the Black Lives Matter movement about this and much more. Uh, one, of the, one of the rallying cries now that we're hearing over and over again, of course, is defund the police. The idea is something that I think the majority of people actually agree with. And it's rooted in this, in this notion that experts should do what experts do. So the question becomes, what things that happen in community do you, do you need somebody with a gun to respond to? Because that's really how people conceptualize the police. It's like bank robberies, okay, cool. Uh, missing kids, probably not. Car crashes, probably not. Traffic violations, probably not. You know, so when we list the things that require the expertise of someone who has the power to kill, the vast majority of responsibilities we give to the police should probably go to experts who handle those things. So that's the core idea. And I think that idea actually isn't controversial. I think that people agree with that idea, even if they struggle with the packaging that people offer. The police disproportionately kill black people and Latinx people in every way that we slice the data. So this is heavily about people of color who are underrepresented in the US population right now in the subsets, overrepresented in the disparity. If you fix this issue of policing so that black people aren't being disproportionately killed, so nobody's being killed, you actually are helping all the Latinx people, you're helping the trans siblings, you're helping everybody, right? So that's why we focus on black people because when we look at the data, black people are often the most marginalized, the most disadvantaged. So if you make a system that works for them, you automatically make a system that works for everybody. But the vision and the Black Lives Matter movement in general Whose lives matter? Everybody's lives matter! face some serious opposition. Opposition that seems to be coming from the top down. This cruel campaign of censorship and exclusion violates everything we hold dear as Americans. 
They want to demolish our heritage so they can impose their new oppressive regime in its place. They want to defund and dissolve our police departments. Think of that. And who better to explain the hostility than Paris Dinard, the Republican National Committee's senior advisor for Black Media Affairs, a poser of BLM and ardent Trump supporter. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you on this, on this new show. Uh, no, I do not support the Black Lives Matter uh, organization. I think that it is a phony organization that is actually doing more harm than good. I'm a person who supports reforms. I think reforms are important, uh, whether it's criminal justice reform that you saw President Trump lead on or, po- or his executive order on safe police for safe communities, uh, which actually is the only piece of action that came about after the horrific death of George Floyd. You do believe, obviously, in the need for police reform. You don't support the Black Lives Matter movement, but you actually mentioned something. So my next question was essentially going to be, what are the Republicans actively doing right now to push forth legislation that would uh, end excessive police force? I mean, look, in Congress, you have to work together. So if you have a piece of legislation that is there, that has the backing of the President of the United States and the entire administration to, to, to push these things out and, and to execute it, then why not start from there? We have seen again and again the use of excessive force on people exercising the First Amendment right. You don't think that's wrong? If law enforcement feels the need to keep the peace and do so by utilizing those techniques, okay. uh, I think they, have a, they, they should do that. If it is found that what law enforcement did was wrong and they can be punished or brought to trial, or uh, that, then, they, that, then you should let the justice system work its way out. The impact that Black Lives Matter is having on policy, politics, sports, and society as a whole is palpable. And so is the backlash. Racism isn't just a black and white problem. It's also a cultural issue, particularly among Latinx populations. Nosotras, las negras y los negros, no estamos representados en espacios de poder como el gobierno, como los medios de comunicación y otros espacios que son muy importantes para la dignidad de nosotros como pueblo afrodescendiente. Within the Latinx community, racism has been a deep, pervasive problem since siempre. But is it even possible to be a racist if you're a person of color? Yes. A lot of white Latinos, they say, oh, how can I be racist? There's also a problem about colorism. It's people of the same race with different skin colors and they don't recognize their own privilege. From probably the day that I was born, people commented on, que blanquita, que pelo tan lindo, que pelo tan lacio, you know, um, all of these things about my appearance. And it wasn't until later on that I noticed, wow, this is actually something that is rooted in colorism. I feel like this just has to be said. Just because you have experienced racism or discrimination does not mean that you are not racist. That white Tina knows what's up. Like many Latinxes, I'm a white passing Mexican American. I've both reaped the benefit of white privilege and been the target of racist remarks. But merely being Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, or Indian, or Asian, or from any non-Eurocentric culture isn't a vindication. And look, I'm not saying that all Mexicans are racists. Some of us, I assume, are good people. The Latinx community isn't a monolith. And when it comes to the intersection between black and brown communities, El Compa Negro is the perfect example of someone whose very livelihood is rooted in the relationship between the two. Meet the kid out of Compton who sings Corridos. I'm always asked, ¿Por qué la música mexicana? Why Spanish music? Why? Why, 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 why? And to be honest, I don't know. It was just something that I was drawn to. It's a part of me. I was living in Compton. Uh, we lived off of a street called Pearl and Peck. Just like, just living life, having fun, you know, just always, just being a kid. This is the house that I grew up in. 
Um, I thank God that I was, you know, raised in this neighborhood because it's very diverse. I had, you know, African-Americans, Latinos, all, you know, in the same block. So I was exposed to, you know, all kinds of different aspects of, you know, to look at life. Before, when I first started singing, I would get a lot of hate from, you know, black people, like especially at school, you know, they would, you know, they wouldn't let me sit with them. You know, my brothers and sisters, they would tell their friends that I was their cousin. <laughs> because they'd be like, why is your brother wearing boots to school? Why is he looking like a Mexican? My opinion to them is not gonna matter. They're gonna feel and think the way that they were, they were programmed to think, you know? I started high school in 2010. And I want to say my sophomore year, I started dating this girl named Paola. She was Mexican. Even though we were in like 2011, 2012, people would look at us like disgusted when we would sit together. I'm not even joking. At my school, Citrus Hill High School, I didn't really see any other, you know, interracial couples. It just, it creeps me out knowing that that's 2011, 2012, that's recent. If I go there now, it's like all mixed. And I like it because it's like, it makes me feel like it's now becoming the new norm. Now people are seeing how bad the racism is in this, learn the culture. And I have mixed kids and I would love for people to open their minds. When you tell me that black lives don't matter, are you telling me that half of my child doesn't matter? Like, or how, how, what sense does that make? You know what I'm saying? I told my girl, you know, I could think my kids came out, you know, light skin, you know. But then like, I thought about that, I said that, and I'm like, no, she's still half black. You know, you can look at her hair and tell she's half black. So, I mean, it makes me proud, but at the same time, it's just like, wow, you know, like all it took was for us to get a president to openly be racist, for people to think that it's okay and to come out of the closet. But I'm glad that that happened because my block list has just been growing. <laughs> Whether or not you're a fan of cross-cultural rancheros embracing Mexican corridos, El Compa Negro's experience highlights the tension that exists between black and brown communities. And here in the U.S., it seems we sometimes forget that black people are as much a part of the Latinx community as any light-skinned, blonde-haired, blue-eyed telenovela star out there. And while I will not apologize for our passion, we do need to acknowledge our history of excluding Afro-Latinxes from our culture, our stories, and even our newsrooms. We often fail to recognize our own biases and blatantly racist cultural norms. Hi, where's your mommy? This is Pam, mom and I looking at the house. Oh, <laughs> thanks princess. Come I told you. Okay. Mira que hacía años que yo no veía tanto junto. Pues hija, ve acostumbrándote, porque entre los que vienen de Haití y los que nos están mandando por el Mariel... No es menos mal que nosotros no somos racistas. The extent of this can be summed up in a phrase commonly used among Latinos, mejorar la raza, which literally translates to improve the race. Something said when a darker skinned Latinx marries a lighter skinned Latinx. This would be an example of the darker skinned Latinx mejorando la raza. Me dicen, me dice, ay, cásate con uno este, de otro país, dice, para que eh, en, conozcas otra cultura, ¿no? Eh, y aparte dice, para, para, este, para mejorar, dice la, <laughs> este, ¿cómo me dijo? Mejorar, o sea, físicamente, ¿no? La raza. La raza. Ah, la raza. Mm. Me dice. Y si escoges uno peor. En las costas, algunos indios regalan a sus hijas a los hombres blancos como yo. Para mejorar su raza. Pero tú no necesitas regalármela. 
Te doy esto por ella. Does that make you uncomfortable? Me too. But many Latinxes today reject this narrative and are doing their part to educate their communities about how this kind of thinking perpetuates violence. And in order to have these kinds of conversations, we have to acknowledge that this part of our cultural legacy exists. My cousins and I would have conversations how if we had kids, how nice it would be if they turned out like our father's side of the family, which is lighter skin with green or blue eyes. And it's embarrassing for me to think of that now, but that is what was taught to us since we were little. In order to fix this, in order to have a positive impact, we have to recognize our own as an Afro-Latino, I've experienced all forms of racism. I've experienced racism that is very covert and passive. Cuando uno va a solicitar trabajo, una de las cosas que te miran es el pelo. Te dicen que te tienes que peinar, pero ahora mismo yo estoy peinada. I've also experienced direct racism, been called racial slurs. I've been told, why do I live in a certain neighborhood? Cuando te dicen, verdad? que eres feo por no tener unas características semejantes a las características europeas, a las características blancas. There's also a problem about colorism. It's people of the same race with different skin colors and they don't recognize their own privilege. Oh, you, you have to be with a white, with a white guy because you have to perfect the race. Maybe in 20 years, to mejorar la raza, will refer to improving the human race by extricating racism in all its forms. But what can we do in the meantime? Apparently, quite a lot. Meet Nydia Simone, AKA Black Tina, a filmmaker, content creator, writer, and producer who's on a mission to amplify Afro-Latinx and Caribbean voices. I created Black Dina not only to amplify the voices of Afro, Latinx, and Caribbean people, but also to celebrate our cultura. We have this robust culture, but I couldn't find that in film or in television anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to change that. And as a filmmaker and a writer, I had the power in my hands to do it. So that's what I'm doing. So talk to us a little bit about the work you're doing right now. One of them is La Bodega, where we talk about an Afro-Latinx family who's forced to sell their bodegas to Jewish real estate developers. And we also launched Conexion, where we talk about the pressing issues in our community. There is so much to be proud about in our history and culture. And I felt like, why are we waiting for other people to celebrate us? Y'all yeah, folks need some discipline. So my work, I love talking about the people who broke barriers and people who paved the way for me to be here with you right now. Por ejemplo, Lulu Guerrero. She was the second black woman to have a reoccurring role on a national television show in the United States. And she was Dominicana. I'm really proud to be a part of this legacy of creators and storytellers. Lulu Guerrero was a pioneer in her own right as she was a model, singer, actress, in a time where black people were rarely seen on screen. Miss Guerrero, wait, why don't we just talk to her? How did you see yourself at the time? Like, did you see yourself as being a pioneer? Or was it a situation where you're just going with the flow? I believe I was just going with the flow, like I said before, because I was too young, I was not thinking of that. And I didn't have any problem. I worked for a black, uh, Modeling agency at that point too, so I was already established in that market, you know, as a black. And um, I did have offer from white agencies. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to switch. Everything went well. Was there like a large at that time? Did you know of large pay disparities? At the beginning, yes. But then my agent said to me, "Lulu, I'm going to put you back in the market as a, 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 with a white salary." Range. And I go, oh, Mrs. Devon, don't do that. Oh, my God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be out of a job. She said, no, I'm going to put you $60 an hour. And I go, oh, my God, I don't think I'm going to get any job. She said, yes, you will. And sure enough, it didn't make any wow. difference. And, uh, yeah, and then, even in those days, that was a lot of money. This is amazing. <laughs> Latin America is no stranger to fighting for the right to be seen and heard. And Afro-Latinos have been putting in the work for quite some time. I mean, it was the first black republic that led to the swath of freedoms. Yes, I'm talking about Haiti. Due to the Haitian Revolution, many countries in Latin America and beyond were able to imagine freedom, fight for it, and win. 
The Haitian Revolution is extra special because not only were they fighting for the independence of state, but the freedom to live without shackles. The Haitian Revolution made way for the independences of the following countries. Like the ocean, our community is vast with many dangers and obstacles, yet effortless beauty. But like the water, you always find a way to overcome. In addition to systemic reform, increasing the visibility of Afro-Latinxes in our communities is another good first step. Maybe what 2020 has exposed most of all is our ability to live with economic uncertainty, remind us of our collective responsibility, and have uncomfortable conversations that challenge everything we believe. Or maybe we're just living in one long interactive episode of Black Mirror, I don't know. Either way, I think Cardi B summed up the collective experience of 2020 back when we were just at the precipice of our no end in sight American made Corona coaster when she said, Shit is real! Shit is getting real! Maybe we should have listened. I'm Gabriela Fresquez, and this is Radar 2020. Thanks for watching Radar 2020. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below and let us know what issues are important to you. But only the important ones, because the frivolous ones are like so 2019. <laughs>